everybody's back for our uh, second set of lessons from Jordan. Jordan gave us an excellent lesson last night, uh, getting us started on thinking about the joy of the journey. Got a couple of uh, really introspective lessons tonight, especially um, considering you know the circumstances we find ourselves in. His first lesson, he's going to talk to us about what to do when you don't know what to do. Uh, so really looking forward to that here in just a moment. We're going to sing, uh, just so everybody knows uh, kind of what tonight's going to look like. We're going to sing a couple songs at the beginning, then Jordan will give us a lesson. And then we'll take a short break, um, have a little bit more singing, about 10 songs in between that. So during that time, everybody can get up, stretch your legs, um, take a pit stop if you need to. And then we're going to come back in here, and Jordan's going to bring us that last lesson. So that's kind of what tonight will look like. And he'll offer an invitation there at the end if anybody needs any prayers of sort there at the end. So that's, that's kind of what tonight looks like. I'm glad we've got more people. I don't like the singing a little more full here tonight. So um, I'm going to start us off with a couple of songs. But before we start singing, let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> our all-wise, all-knowing, our faithful Father in heaven, you're holy, you're worthy of all of our praise. We are grateful for your plan and your providence. We're thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, that binds us all together. I pray, Father, that the love that you have shown for us through Christ uh, develops and is strengthened in this body of believers as we come together um, to listen to your word being taught and as we sing to one another and encourage one another this evening. I pray, Father, that you allow us open hearts and open minds. Help us to be challenged by what your word says. Help us, Father, we ask to be honest with ourselves and uh, we pray, Father, that if there are any barriers or any impediments that might be in our hearts that keep us from seeing you clearly, we ask, Father, that you would just break those down and allow us this time and this opportunity to know you uh, more intimately and, and more truly by the time we spend with one another and by the time we spend with you. Again, Father, we pray for Jordan. We thank you for allowing us this time with him. We pray for his heart. We pray for his mind as he brings to us another message from your word. We thank you for the encouragement and the admonitions that he gave to us last night. We ask, Father, that you give him clarity of thought and precision in the things that he has to say to us. And I ask, Father, that, that you allow us to, to be touched by the things that he says. We thank you for his good work, and we thank you for his zeal in the kingdom, and we ask, Father, that we can encourage him as he continues to do his work uh, among us here this evening. Thank you for all that you do for us. We, we ask, Father, that you would listen to us now as we lift our voices to you. May you be honored, may you be exalted, and may you be glorified by everything we do here this evening. In your son Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Just a couple of songs. The first song we'll sing is, I Need Thee Every Hour. <clears throat> I need thee every
Stand up and we'll sing, I am thine, O Lord. I am thine, O Lord. Glad you're here. Glad to see your, your faces among us tonight. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, if you open your Bibles there. And that's where our study is going to come from tonight, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And we'll look at that text here in just a moment. If you're here tonight visiting as I am, we're just so thankful that you're here. Whether in person or maybe online, uh, if you're visiting maybe by the invitation of a family member or a friend or just here on your own, we're glad you're here. There's a lot of things you could be doing on a Saturday night, and so your sacrifice to be here and spend some time with God's people and God's Word is noticed, and we're thankful that you're here, thankful for you giving your time and attention to these things. How was your Saturday? 
Did you have a good day? Moves by quick, doesn't it? It's hot, isn't it? I don't think Texas understands the weather change very often. Someone told me there's two seasons in Texas, summer and almost summer, and I'm not sure quite where we are in the change of any of that. But you know, the, the, the great thing, so many of you echoed from last night when we studied last night, the things that don't change are what fix us, you know? I mean, we can't change the weather. And so much of what's happened this year is just outside of our control. I mean, none of us would have chosen the events of this year to happen the way that they did. It's outside of our control. But our Lord is on the throne, and that side is outside of everyone's control. He will always reign. He is always our king. And that's why we have comfort and a common faith and a common goal, and that's why we're together. I heard a story of a 16-year-old who came to his dad, and he said, Dad, I, I just got my license. Can I have the, t- the keys to the car? I want to take it out for a drive. He said, well, son, I'll give you the keys when you do three things, three conditions you got to meet. Number one, you got to be reading your Bible. You haven't cracked that thing open in I don't know how long. And number two, you got to get your grades up. They're tanking. you got to pick those up. And then number three, got to get a haircut. Your hair's super long. You're not a beetle. Get your haircut, and then I'll get you the keys. Well, a couple months passed by, and he came back. He says, Dad, I've done everything you've asked. Can I have the keys to the car? He said, well, son, I've, I've noticed you've been reading your Bible more. I'm just so impressed. Every morning you're in your Bible. I'm so proud of you. And I've talked to your teachers. Your grades are getting up. But son, your hair is even longer now than when we talked last time. The son said, well, Dad, I've been reading in the Bible. And everyone in the Bible had long hair. Moses had long hair. Elijah had long hair. Even Jesus had long hair. My dad said, that's true, son. And they walked everywhere they went. I love that. I love that little story. Now, here's the thing, and this is where, why this is important for us tonight. A lot of what we talked about last night and what we're going to talk about right now is going to be really similar. You know, the, the nature of talking about fear and overcoming your fear, so those are really common subjects. But we need to put some, some application to this. We need to find ways of walking it off the page. If it just remains truth and we don't know how to put it into practice, then it's not going to serve us the way that God intends it to. And so tonight, I'm hoping this lesson right here is going to be some practical application about how to handle those times in our lives that we just don't know what to do. We don't have an answer, but we're going to find the answer here in God's Word. We're looking at a king who gives us an honest prayer in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. The king is King Jehoshaphat. If you know anything about the kings of Judah, most of them were were bad. They were wicked kings, but there were a few who were good, a few who were righteous kings. In fact, if you go back a couple chapters to chapter 17 of 2 Chronicles, you read a little bit about Jehoshaphat. It says in verse 3 of 2 Chronicles 17, The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father David's earlier days and did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father, followed his commandments, and did not act as Israel did. So the Lord established the kingdom in his control, and all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat, and he had great riches and honors. You just get this idea. He's not going to follow the mold that's been set before him. No, he's going back to the ways of David, and he's honoring the ways of the Lord. And so in this chapter, he's tearing down the idols. He is setting up teachers to teach the word throughout the land. In chapter 19, the chapter before our study, in chapter 19, he appoints these judges in verse 5 to go throughout all the land. And notice what he says in verse 6. It's a great thing for us to to circle around for for leaders in the congregation, for teachers, those who are going to teach God's word. Notice what he says in verse 6. He said to the judges, Consider what you're doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord who is with you when you render judgment. uh, Now then, let the fear, in verse 7, Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be very careful what you do. For the Lord our God will have no part in unrighteousness or in partiality or in the taking of a bribe. He says you need to take your job seriously because it's not just between man. You're doing this in the place of God. You are judging the people on God's behalf. So you be careful about the judgments you make. This king does a lot of good for God's people. Does a lot of good for the land. Our chapter begins in chapter 20. And in verse 1 it says, Now it had come about it. After this, the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the the uh, Meunites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. You got three nations teaming up together, rallying against Judah, and it was their goal. We're just going to take them out. We're going to wipe them out. Well, usually, in the Old Testament times, if something was really serious for God's people, they would do two things. They'd call a fast, and then they'd pray. The fasting is nothing is going to distract us from our devotion and our focus on God. And the prayer is the outpouring of that focus. We're going to give all of our needs to the throne of God. And so you notice in verse 3, Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord 
and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. So here's the fast. They're ready to focus. What follows then is one of the most beautiful prayers that's ever been prayed. It starts in verse 5. The king just opens up his honest heart before the people as he prays his prayer to the Lord. Look at verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? Are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand, so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, O oh, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? They have lived in it and have built you a sanctuary there for your name, saying, should, should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and will cry to you in our distress, and you will hear and deliver us. Now behold, the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you did not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. See how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out from your possession, which you have given us as an inheritance. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us. Nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are on you. All Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. In other words, everyone heard this incredible prayer. And what a prayer, isn't it? Was it not you, O Lord, who promised this land? Was it not you, O Lord, who by your strength and your deliverance gave us this land in which we enjoy? And was it not you? for whom we built this house, and we built it with the faith that, that if any of our enemies came and rallied against us, we could call on your name with the trust and the hope that you will defend us and provide for us, because, Lord, that's what's happening. We are outnumbered, we're outmanned, and we don't know what to do. And so we're looking to you. Isn't that incredible? All I want to focus on, we could go through history, but we have a lot of preaching tonight. I'm so sorry a lot of me tonight. So we're going to get through this first section by just looking at the last phrase in this prayer. Down at verse, uh, verse 12. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Just a few observations from this phrase. You notice at least at first that he rightly assessed the situation. We are powerless against this great multitude. What's fascinating is if you go back to chapter 17 of 2 Chronicles, and you do a little math, you add up all the armies that are listed there, he had about over a million valiant warriors in his army. So that tells us one or two things. Either by the time this event is taking place, his army had severely been hit, or more likely, the enemy he is facing now in chapter 20 is so great, is so powerful, even the great strength of which he has accumulated could not be enough to withstand this force. You notice he didn't do what some leaders do. You ever know a leader who gets up there and he decides just to bluff it on the spot? Oh, it may be rough, but I got it. I got a plan, a 40-day plan. I'm going to unveil it in a little bit of time. It's not so bad. It could be worse. Who else gets up there in front of everyone and says, we can't do it. We're outmatched. We're outmanned. There's no way possible that we could win. You know why he did so? Because he saw the truth, the honest truth. Rightly assessing it on our own, through our own strength, we will lose. There's something rich there I think we need to appreciate for a moment. The ability to rightly assess, assess the situation is something that I think is lost on some of us. We don't get it as often as we should. Sometimes we fail to see the problems right before our eyes. Because oftentimes we don't go to the doctor until when? So it's really bad. You ever know someone that way? They get a cough, and then it turns into a cough and a sneeze, and their wife is saying, will you please go to the doctor? It's fine. It's fine. They get a fever, a cough, and a sneeze, and boils. Will you finally go to the doctor? It's fine. This happens all the time. Rub some dirt on it. There's some people, they, go, they don't go to the doctor until, until they're really sick. There's some people who don't make changes in their lives until finally the problems unfold and things are falling before them. It's the inability to assess the situation. Let me ask you a question. How many strong, vibrant marriages do you know end overnight in divorce? 
doesn't really happen, does it? How many strong, confident Christians, people that have a, a vibrant faith, go from that strong faith to the next day just leaving the Lord altogether? That just that doesn't happen, does it? It's a small, gradual drift. A small fading from the Lord in a marriage. We're just not talking like we used to. We're not spending time together. Maybe we haven't been romantic in a while, haven't been intimate, we haven't had that one-on-one -on -one time together, and slowly over time we've drifted apart from one another. Or in a faith. You know, it's been a long time since I've read my Bible. I, mean, I can't remember the last time I picked it up. And I haven't been praying like I ought to. I haven't been spending time with God's people as I ought to. I haven't been in worship or in a year like this, even if I'm not comfortable in person, I haven't been tuning in as I ought to, and it's that small, that small gradual drift. What happens, brethren, if while you're driving, you let go of the wheel? You know what happens? It would be nice if you could just kind of sit back and it just stays in its lane. Wouldn't that be nice? And maybe you have a car that does that. Mine definitely does not. You let go of the wheel, and without, without some time, it starts to swerve a little bit, doesn't it? And so if you notice it, you'll notice it more tonight because we're, we're calling attention to it. All during your driving, especially if you're, if you're on the highway like I will, you're just doing this the whole time. Little corrections. Because if you don't pay attention, you're going to, you're going to drift. In fact, how many of you have seen this? I saw it today. You see someone, and you're behind them, and the car starts to drift and drift and drift and drift, and then they hit that rumble patch, and then they come back over, and then they drift and they drift and they drift and they're... And so you finally say, I'm, a, I'm, not, I'm done with this. And so you go around them, and you think, what is wrong with this person? So you pull up next to them. What do you see oftentimes in the driver's seat? Right? They're texting, they're posting, they're updating their status, driving down the highway, about to meet the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> they're distracted, right? They don't realize they're drifting because they're not paying attention. They're not assessing the situation as they ought to. There's a lot of people who are in great danger because they're not assessing the reality either of their marriage, or their homes, or their own walk with the Lord. Listen to the language here in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 16. Listen to the language. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Do you hear the language? Pay close attention, both eyes up. Hands on the wheel. I want you to notice. Pay attention to the things you're teaching and what you are living. Because if you do so, you're going to ensure not only the salvation of those who are listening to you, but you're going to guarantee you're going to stay on that path and you're going to make it home. If I keep your marker here at 2 Chronicles 20, and turn over with me to Proverbs 27. I want you to look at one verse with me in Proverbs 27. I love this verse for, for many reasons because it's, it's applicable in a lot of areas of leadership whether if it's in a local congregation and the leadership there in the church, or for our application tonight for moms and dads. It's a language of shepherds. And if you are a leader, if you are a parent, you are a shepherd. And your sheep are your children. God has given them into your care, and it's your responsibility to care for those sheep and to lead them where they belong. And so I want you to notice the verse, one simple verse. Proverbs 27 and verse 23. Know well the condition of your flocks, and pay attention to your herds. Don't you love that verse? Know well the condition of your flocks and pay attention to your herds. Do you know your kids? Do you know them well? Do you know how they're different? What makes them different? Do you know where they struggle? Maybe in their different ages, what they struggle with today. Do you know the issues they're facing in light of 2020 and everything that's going on in this year? Are you annoyed with me right now? Look at that last phrase again, parents. Let it prick. Pay attention to your flock. Pay attention. Nothing will substitute from our time and attention, especially when our kids are young. Can't tell you how many times you see it. The kids are out there on the field and they're playing, and all something great happens. They make a pass or they make a score, and they look up for that validation. And mom and dad are on the phone. 
Or how many times, even in a place like this, the children run up and they say, Mom, 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 Daddy, Daddy, look at this. Daddy, Daddy, look, look, Daddy, Daddy. We're not paying attention. We're too busy trying to text and Facebook post about being a good parent rather than getting off our phones and just being a good parent. Pay attention. Pay attention. To those who are in my camp, I say this because I need it. I need this. We're only going to be here once. And this is the most important time in their life. These formative years when they are young and they're figuring out who they are and what's important and they're learning about God, this is our one shot. And so let's put our phones down. Let's unplug for a while and let's pay attention to the things that matter the most. All of us could, could use some refreshing from that 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. I'm not working here for a minute. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. We might just need to find it in our Bibles. Do I need to do something here? Do I throw it? Oh, oh. I do throw it. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. Test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you indeed fail the test. Every day we're in the Word and we're reading, but it's not just to gain knowledge. That's part of it. We're reading this to see, here is Jesus, here's the perfect standard. Now, how do I live up to that standard? I'm looking at the mirror of my heart. Am I becoming more like Him? Are there some things in my life, some attitudes in my heart that I need to change because I'm examining myself every day by this standard? Rightly assess the situation. Second thing the king did back in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 is that he rightly admitted his insufficiency. He did something that no leader ever does. Who would ever think of a king who says, I don't know what to do? I don't know. I mean, can you imagine this? George, can you imagine Nick Saban? One, I don't even know how many championships. I don't even care if you like this team or not, Alabama football. But can you imagine? Fourth quarter, one play left. Third, they're down on the, the third yard line. Timeout is called. The team comes in, and they look around him, and they huddle around Saban, and he goes, guys, I don't know. Beats me. I got no idea. I don't know what to do. We think that's why we pay you the big bucks. You always know what to do. Well, here's the king, and the armies are on the doorstep, and he prays before the whole nation, God, we can't beat them in battle. And if I'm going to be honest, I don't even know what to do. Now, I know that sounds strange, at least at face value, but can you, can you sympathize with that at all? Have you had times in your life where you felt absolutely lost? I mean, maybe you came out of nowhere, laid off from the job, a diagnosis you weren't prepared for, a loved one who had a tragedy happen to them, a sickness, an illness, an unexpected death. And in the moment it hits, and you get on your knees, and in any normal circumstance, you know the words, you know the things that you would say, but in that moment, there's so much pain, and there's so much hurt, and there's so much confusion. As Paul would say about the role of the Holy Spirit in, in Romans 8 and verse 26, that, that the times that we, we do not know what to pray for as we ought, it seems like the only things that come out of our, our mouth is help, help. Lord, please. I need you. I don't know what to do. Have you been there before? I'm so desperate and I'm so hurting. And the words, I can't even think of the words, Lord, I just, I need you. I need you. I need you now. The amazing thing about this prayer, though, is that even though he didn't know what to do, he knew the one thing he could do, and that was to place his life in the hands of God. But our eyes are on you. Our eyes look to you, our King, for the answer, for the hope, for the support, for deliverance. We don't know where to turn, but Lord, we know that we can turn to you. Our eyes are looking to you. Anytime we end up looking at our problems and focusing more on the issues, we tend to sink. 
we sink in our fears. We drown in worry. We're defeated by discouragement. You know, it's kind of like Peter. He's out there on the waves, and he's walking when he's, when he's looking at Jesus. But the moment he takes his eyes off of the Savior and looks at the waves, what happens? Now, do you know some people in 2020 who, because of the waves of COVID and the waves of fear and the waves of political division, have taken their eyes off of Jesus, and they seem really defeated today? Do you know anyone that way? Because when we take our eyes off of Jesus and we look at our issues, we sink. The fears are too great. The enemy is too strong. Why do we have verses in like Hebrews 12 and verse 2? Fix your eyes on Jesus. Why? Well, we noticed it last night. Because he is who he was, who, who he will always be today and every tomorrow. Which means, as Isaiah would say, have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable, which means this, God will never tire. God never weakens. There is nothing too great, too strong, too hard for our God. But the other side of it we didn't get to last night is the understanding and the knowledge and the depth of understanding in the heart of God. The depth of knowledge in the heart of God. There is nothing God does not know. There's something too complicated for God to figure out. There's nothing that has come into the scene in all of human existence that God says, you know, that's a stumper. I've never thought of that before. I don't know what to do. God knows everything. But here's the thing. We say that we say God knows everything and we cast it up to the heavens. God knows everything. He's so far above everything and everyone. It's this amazing and lofty thought. Can you pull that down for a minute? God knows everything, which means God knows everything about you. Everything there is possibly to know about you, which means that he's got numbered the very hairs on your head. Now, some like Daniel are making that a little easier than others. But he knows us, and he knows us well. In fact, have you ever had those nights, as the psalmist described, so lost in emotion, so wounded inside that you can't sleep and so you toss and you toss and you toss and you toss on your bed. Someone says, you've kept count of my tossings. You put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Every time you've tossed, God saw. Every tear you've shed, God noticed. Every sleepless night you've had, he saw. He knows. And then those prayers in which we say, I just, I don't even know what to ask. I don't even know what words to say. God even knows the things that you need to ask. He knows it before you even say it because he knows you perfectly. He knows you better than you know yourself. And so when you get to a passage like this one in Psalm 139, and David asks this, this hypothetical question, he says, he says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Now get the idea. He says, if I travel as high up as I could possibly go past the moon, would you be with me? But if I sank down as far deep as, as possible, even to the realm of the soul, the departed Sheol, would you be with me there? I journeyed with the sun as far east as possible. Even there, would you be with me? Or if I went the complete opposite direction, O oh Lord, as far, as far as the eye could see, even there, would you be with me? Put yours in there. Look at that passage on the board and put yours there. Lord, it... If I have to go to the unemployment, unemployment office or the homeless shelter or the food kitchen, if I have to go to the principal's office or the police station on behalf of, a, of another, of a loved one, if I have to go to the hospital, the ICU, ICU room, or if I have to be in the waiting room while another goes beyond those surgical doors, if I have to go to the nursing home, or the funeral home, or the graveside, even there, will you be with me? Even there? 
What's his answer? Even there, my right hand will hold you. Even there. Even in the valley. The dark valley of life. The dark valley of the shadow of death. There's no fear in such place for God's people. Because you're with me. And your staff and your rod to comfort me. This whole phrase is a phrase of trust. Our eyes look to you. Our eyes are on you. It's a way of saying, God, I don't have the answers, but I know that you do. And so I'm going to place my complete trust and dependence on the king. You ever sprain your ankle? Sports players, you ever sprain your ankle before? You know it hurts real bad, especially if you sprain it bad. And so you wrap it up. And you put your ice, and then you stay off it. That's what the doctor says, stay off the ankle. And so you got your crutches, and you're moving along. You know there comes a time, though, after a while, and you've let it heal, there comes that moment, that pitiful moment, that pit- um, pivotal, that wasn't coming, that left. <laughs> An important moment of truth. When the crutches go down and the band is unwrapped, and you have to take that first step. There's a lot of faith that goes into that step, you know. Because what you're trusting is, when I put my foot down, it's not going to give in under the weight of my body, and I'm going to come crashing to the floor. So I'm going to take this step with a, with a faith and a trust that my foot's going to hold me up. Brethren, that's faith. That's our faith in God. Because when we go to God and we cast our burdens into Him in prayer, as Peter would tell us to in 1 Peter 5, verse 7, what we're saying is, God... You you invite me to give you my burdens. You you call on me to place my trust in you. And so I'm going to give it to you. I'm giving you my worries and my cares and my burdens. God, I'm going to to give you my life and my plans and my dreams. I'm giving my life in your hands, trusting that when I give it to you, when I take this step, I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to crumble. That you can handle the weight of the burdens that I've been carrying all this long. And what do we find? When you really give your burdens to the Lord in prayer, and I mean really, not that you pray and you pull it back down. When you give your burdens to the Lord, you end up finding that that God is more than able to handle anything that comes across us in this life. And we find that those burdens so often that we trudge through this life, worry and anxiety and fear and depression, those were never burdens we were meant to bear. There's a... There's a statue on Fifth Avenue in New York outside of this major corporation. It's at the god Atlas, the Greek god Atlas. The thing about this statue is, if you know anything about Atlas, he's this big muscular guy. Imagine me with about 200 more pounds of muscle. And so he kind of looks like this outside the building. Up on his shoulders is the world. But the world is so big and seems so heavy, he's barely able to stand under the weight of the world. Across the street on Fifth Avenue is a little church, and in its courtyard is a statue. It's a statue of the boy Jesus who's holding the world in his hand. What side of the street are you living on today? Are you trying to figure it out all on your own? Are you trying to handle your life's issues on your own? I got this. I don't need help. I don't need God. You can. You can try. But it's going to be a lot like that statue. You're going to crumble under a weight and a burden you were never meant to bear. But if you, as Peter invites us to, cast your burdens to the Lord, cast them, give them to God, what you will find is what he intended for us all along, a peace that surpasses all understanding. Here's how we walk it off the page, brethren. We mentioned this last night, and I'll mention it again. I don't know. I don't know what the rest of this year is going to look like. I don't know what 2021 is going to look like. There's some unknowns that we will face. When it comes to the time in our life, and it will come, and we don't know what to do, we don't know our next steps forward, we now know what to do. We bend in prayer, and we take this prayer to the throne of God. Lord, this is too much for me. 
this burden, this weight, this pain, this sorrow is so great, it's almost more than I can bear. And I don't know what to do. I don't even know my next steps forward. But I know that I can trust in you, and so I'm putting my eyes and I'm placing my life on you. Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord, our God, we have faced a year of of unknowns, Father, and you know that. This has been a year that has tested us in in so many different ways. It's tested our, our faith. It's tested our marriages. It's tested our homes. It's tested our congregations. We have faced such great unknowns and uncertainties through the the issues of this year. We have found so much comfort and peace and hope, realizing that in all the things that have happened and all the things that have changed, you remain the same and that you are on the throne and you have been with us through every storm that we have faced. It is our desire and our longing, Father, that in whatever future we will face, in whatever storm that may come to pass, to have the confidence of faith that we find through your word, to know that you're, you stand with us in it. That even though you have promised that this life that we have is not one that's free of pain and of sorrow, we know that, that we don't go through these sorrows alone. That we don't stand through the storms alone. That you are with us. And so, Father, in these moments in which we don't know what to do, in the times in which we feel burdened by the cares of the world, it's our hope and our prayer, Father, that we'll look in your direction. We'll cast our cares upon your shoulders. That we'll lean more on prayer and pray more and worry less. And we'll leave from these moments of prayer with a far greater confidence that you, you are king and you remain in control. Thank you for this study, our Father. Thank you for this, this rich example of this, this faithful king. And help us to employ this rich example in our own lives. Bless our hour of worship and our hour of study. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, brethren. Our wonderful God in heaven, we're comforted knowing that you are with us. We're so thankful to know that we have you to bear our burdens and to help us through this life as we strive together to live faithfully to you, as we look forward to the time we'll live in heaven with you forever. Dear Father, we know of those who are are suffering not just health reason, health uh, issues in their life, dear Father, chronic health issues, ongoing things that uh, they need help with. And we know of those who have recently lost loved ones who are bearing uh, a pain that is uh, unsearchable. Father, we pray for their comfort. We pray for their understanding of your strength and your presence in their life. Dear Father, we pray that as we uh, prepare for and look forward to the future, uh, as we have discussed it tonight, not knowing the things that we are about to face, we pray that you'll help us to be mindful of the things that we've seen here tonight in your word, things that give us strength to to know that we can carry on, that we can not grow weary, not grow faint, and that we can remain faithful, and we can encourage and strengthen and love one another to do the same. But we do so uh, so much look forward to the time we will no longer have to strive like this, that we will be in heaven with you. We pray that that day comes soon, dear Father. We're so thankful for Jesus, your Son and our Savior, for the forgiveness of sins that we have in Him, for the great hope of heaven that we have because of Him. And we pray, dear Father, that you'll help us to grow and strengthen from day to day uh, as we strive together here. Father, we pray that you'll forgive us for our sins, for the times that we've fallen short, and 
not done the things that you'd expect of us. Help us to do better. We pray all these things, dear Father, through your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.